Yeah, good, good morning uh, and, and welcome to today's Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment webinar. Um, today's conversation is entitled Promoting Equity and Health Through Science, a model from an anti-colonial marine science laboratory. Uh, my name's Nick Reardon, and on behalf of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, I'll be hosting today's webinar and uh, yeah, calling in from Anchorage, Alaska, as usual. This is the traditional and unceded lands of the Denina people. So I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge and thank the stewards of these lands along with those of uh, yeah, the many places that we all call home. For those of you new to these gatherings, Che Alaska, it's a regional partnership of a larger national collaborative on health and environment. Um, and together, Che and Che Alaska, we work to advance knowledge and action to address the growing concerns around links between human health and environmental factors. And we have websites you can check out at akaction.org or healthandenvironment.org for more info on that. Um, this session is uh, more of a fireside chat um, interview format uh, rather than strictly presentation. And so feel free, we'll prioritize questions from the audience. Uh, and there's a Q and A button, I think just down at the bottom of your screen that you can type questions into. You can also just ask your questions live. Uh, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute your line. I, uh, I apologize that after over a year of facilitating these conversations, I've come down with a cold. Uh, and so I ask for your patience and apologize if I have the, the occasional cough. Um, but on the plus side, um, I've added a nice, you know, lower pitch and uh, gravel to my voice, which may be somewhat entertaining. Um, so now on to the reason we're all here today. We're ever so grateful to be joined by Dr. Max Liberon to discuss equity in science, um, anti-colonial science, and uh, their work at an anti-colonial feminist and indigenous-led marine science laboratory. Um, just as a little more of an introduction, Dr. Liberon is the director of CLEAR, the Civic Laboratory for Environmental Action Research. It's an indigenous-led marine plastic pollution laboratory. Um, and they're an, also an assistant professor of geography at Memorial University in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, as well as an author of dozens of peer reviewed works on plastic pollution, a soon to be released book entitled Pollution is Colonialism and managing editor of what I find to be a very thought provoking website, uh, Discard Studies, which weaves together things discarded. So consumer products, uh, as well as knowledge and people uh, and the ideas that perpetuate those behaviors. So uh, Dr. Lieberman, welcome. And I so appreciate the work you're doing uh, both at CLEAR and in your writing. And um, thanks so much for joining us here today. Uh, my pleasure. Do you mind if I start by introducing myself? Please. Like in a different way. Tanshik, <laughs> yeah. Max Livrand de Chinakashun, la clivish du chien, ni kia My name is Dr. Max Livrand. I'm calling from St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, which is the homelands of the Beotuk. And the uh, province of Newfoundland and Labrador are the homelands of the Mi'kmaq, the Inuit, and the Inuit, as well as the Beotuk. I'm originally from Treaty 6 uh, territory in Alberta. I used to say Northern Alberta, but if I'm talking to folks in Alaska, it's not so Northern. <laughs> uh, in a, a place called Lac La Biche is where I grew up, but my family is Michif and they come from Red River. So yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, you're most welcome. And yeah, to not waste any time here, um, I, I really am intrigued and would love to hear your thoughts on, on yeah, the, the anti-colonial science and the, the feminist values. Um, uh, that your lab is uh, is is modeling, and so yeah, if you want to maybe start, give some background here on on what anti-colonial science is, or sure. Uh, so it's actually, uh, you know, sometimes you say, oh, what is anti-colonial science? Well, I would say, well, what's colonial science? And people are usually pretty ready to answer that, uh, even if they haven't thought a lot about it before. So you know, a colonial science is a science that assumes access to indigenous land. Um, that puts Western science as the best and really only form of legitimate knowledge and other things might can get conscripted into it, but they're like gravy and not the thing itself. Um, or forms of knowledge that are used in the service of framing Indigenous people in deficit, uh, right? Like they don't have enough of this or they're suffering from that and this knowledge tells us about that. Um, knowledge that's in the service of settling, settlers, 
right? So um, a lot of uh, Western science dedicated to like how to acclimate uh, white folks to, to new territories, right? 17th, 18th, 19th centuries and onwards. Um, poor relations with animals and all the relatives, right? So people are usually pretty good at naming colonial sides of science. Anti-colonial science just means not that, different than that, uh, intentionally different than that. And so there's actually a lot of different types of anti-colonial sciences, including indigenous science, um, which is science done by indigenous folks, uh, maybe with or without uh, Western science and scientists, but maybe with. Uh, but there are other anti-colonial scientists or sciences as well um, that don't have to be indigenous. You just don't be a jerk in certain ways and uh, uh, that'll do it. So um, one of the things that I think is really important to recognize with anti-colonial science is that it's not synonymous with, with just being an asshole. So for instance, a lot of well-intentioned science uh, that's environmental, that is, that is working towards environmental goods is still colonial if it assumes access to land. So we have this issue all the time here with beach cleanups. Environmental good, colonial not good because it doesn't ask, they don't ask permission. It's not, you know, it doesn't, doesn't follow uh, indigenous land claims or even um, indigenous priorities for, for pollutants or, or research questions or these sorts of things. Um, so anti-colonial science in our lab, in CLEAR, uh, looks like a lot of things. Um, we structure it in a really particular way, which is uh, the way that I was taught to do good land relations, which isn't like, do good land relations. It's uh, lead with humility, with the idea that you're always, always connected to other things. You are not better than other things. You don't know and can never know anything. The smartest person in the room isn't as smart as two people in the room, no matter who they are. Um, there are many ways to know things and those many ways are important, right? That sort of humility, um, as well as accountability, like do your chores, know your manners, um, that sort of stuff. So, so if you do science according to humility and accountability, you will probably end up doing an anti-colonial science, right? If you follow it all the way down. Um, Right, so uh, I think one of the things we talked about, uh, Nick, earlier was was firsting in science. So this thing, be like, we are, this is the first report on plastic in the Torn Gap Mountains. I'm sorry, but probably not. And the first report was probably one fisherman talking to another fisherman, or one fish talking to you know a squid or something like that. So don't. That's cheeky. Uh, so don't do that. Don't first in research. You know it. it yeah. Um, or. Um, in CLEAR, for instance, we don't do plastic research on crustaceans or bivalves um, because currently the protocols to do that, you need to use KOH, uh, potassium uh, hydroxide, which is very toxic. Um, and uh, that makes toxic waste. And that's a bad relationship that like um, it doesn't justify it. Like there's no way to justify it according to original instructions or what happens to relatives when you do that or so we don't do that kind of science because uh, we haven't have, have figured out how to do it in a humble and accountable way maybe one day we will today we haven't um, so we focus on other types of research those are just some some examples yeah that's that's fabulous uh, I uh... I really appreciate this, that, that juxtaposition of, you know, this is what we, we can understand what colonial is and the anti-colonial is trying to say not that, and that that leaves this openness to, we don't know exactly what anti-colonial science will be. It's sort of, these are our best attempts and it's a, it's a bit of a, um, it's, it's changing. It's, and, and motivated by these values that, like you said, don't be a jerk. I feel like um, you're describing, you know, things that were learned from kindergarten and you know in childhood, and these are these are practices that you could uphold in your uh, in your in your marine laboratory. These are practices you could uphold in relation to any human <laughs> or any organization. I could be reading your lab manual and taking notes on how to be a better a better partner uh, <laughs> with yeah. my girlfriend. Um, yeah, if, uh, yeah. We actually we actually had some filmmakers in the lab a couple of years ago to make a documentary about the about the lab, and they actually took our lab book, which has these values and stuff outlined, and they put it in their filmmaking practice. So next time they made a film, which just came out, it's a sci-fi film, wow. they tried to film make with, with humility and equity, right? These sorts of stuff. And I was like, damn, that, that, that walked right out of there. That was all right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one of the things you were saying that reminds me is part of the reason that I very self-consciously frame Clear's work as anti-colonial 
uh, instead of indigenous science, we do indigenous science. There's a bunch of indigenous folks in the lab, a bunch of indigenous partners, especially in Nazi Avut. Um, we do indigenous science, but there are a ton of white settlers in the lab. There are a ton of settlers, like settlers of color in the lab, um, and they don't do indigenous science. They do anti-colonial science, and so it it uh, it keeps our manners straight, keeps our accountabilities clear, keeps our relations clear, and sometimes we we evoke like the two row wampum, which is a treaty uh, that where the metaphor was, you know, it's it's two rivers flowing, but they don't cross, right? We're going in the same direction. We might have the same goals, but that's your business, and this is our business, and you don't get in my business, right? White folks aren't doing indigenous science, and indigenous folks aren't doing whatever the other side is. So um, we come together, we're standing with each other, we're going in the same direction, but we, we have different techniques and we have different relations. So like if we do ceremony in the lab, so one of the things we do is uh, our samples, because we sample fish and seal and, and that sort of stuff. And we get our samples from hunters and fishers, uh, mostly Inuit right now with who we're working with. And when we're done, as long as there's not a lot of contamination and there hasn't been, um, we return those to the land. Um, that's a Métis tradition, that's an Inuit tradition, that's a, that's an Innu tradition uh, in, in this province. Um, but when settlers come to that, they don't hang out with the tobacco and all this sort of stuff, but they, they can use frameworks of like, oh yeah, it's good to return nutrients. It's good to, it's, it's good not to put these people, these, these um, specimens in like the biohazardous waste receptacle, which is where they would normally go. Um, it's, it's, this is part of ecofeminism where like, you know, the, you know, there's there's lots of different ways to to do good without having to appropriate like indigenous science or, or ceremony or something like that. And it's what lets the lab stand together um, really well, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I certainly get that impression when reading the manual um, that it's yeah, it's a very thoughtful document and um, that it's yeah, you're you're it's thoughtful from the opinions of uh, of a, of a yeah, diverse group of people. Um, it's it's impressive in itself. I ha I couldn't recommend it enough. If that film crew has has been enjoying it even half as much as I have, um, and I really recommend it to our audience members. And there's a link on our website. Um, it's it it addresses these values um, right at the outset, and it also it has has detailed steps um, and and recommendations as well as protocols. I mean, it's it is a lab manual. Um, so we're we may be talking about anti colonial science and and um, and these ideas, but it also gets down to uh, descriptions of how to sample guts and how to process them to investigate microplastics um, and, and open hardware aspects, descriptions of how to build the apparatus even. Um, could you, yeah, yes. could you, yeah go ahead. Uh, so just, I just want to say something about protocol. So, I mean, both science and indigenous ceremony or at least Mitch of ceremony uses the word protocol to mean actually almost the same thing, which is like how you orient yourself to your world to produce goods and whether that good is like valid and replicable science or whether that good is like good relations with relatives or kin or humility or whatever. It's, they're, this, they're the same sort of stuff. They're like guidelines um, that put you in the world in a certain sort of set of concrete and specific relations to do good, right? They're orienting, I call them orienting technologies. So yeah, it's not a coincidence that our value stuff um, and our like how to get a fish are in the same document. And by the way, we're about to update that document because the one that's on our website is older and we've done a lot of work on it. And also we're turning parts of it into short films. Uh, some of those protocols are being turned into films by that same uh, film crew who's like come back. We're friends now, I guess, with couple three films. And so they've come back to make short films of our specific protocols. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that, yeah. That's both yeah, one. And they're really good at it. <laughs> like there's a difference between a professional filmmaker and stuff I shoot on my phone and then put together later. Uh, they're better is the main difference. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense to me. There's certainly some skills there. Um, yeah, the, that, that, that idea that, that you know, methodology or protocols are, they're a way of being and it's a way of, um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, this, these are, these are ideas. These aren't my own ideas, but I've, in reading your, um, in reading your writing and, and that that's come across and I find it re very relatable too, to um, when I, when I, in, in Alaska, the, the, the Yupik, for example, the, many of the stories that I've read ha talks about an awareness. Um, the world has an awareness of you and, um, 
every, everything, you know, rocks, trees, animals, and, and that they're, they're in relation with each other. So whether you're practicing science or yeah, you're playing with your child, uh, these, or out walking and, uh, and engaging with the ocean or you know the land it's it's all it's all something connected um so i think that's yeah that's very understandable we may be a, a continent apart but i think there's some values here uh that are definitely relatable to uh, alaskans um that uh yeah that aspect of 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 open openness uh, or sorry equity equity in, in in science was another topic that i really wanted to touch on um, as we go along, and in particular, the the accessibility of this information that you have on your website, or that is in your lab manual, or um, how these film film crew is able to take this information and utilize it. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about prioritizing that accessibility um, in your work. All right. So you started with equity. You went to open. You ended up in accessibility. So I'm going to sort of track through that as well, because um, I think sort of like how the lab runs with values that then manifest themselves in something we call anti-colonial science. Same things with how um, open science hardware, just making tools um, that are freely accessible, you can download the plans and make them yourself, comes out of a uh, concept of equity as well as humility and, and accountability. So. Uh, in my fabulous Zoom slide deck, I always have this image, which is one from one of the films about our protocols. Now you can tell that this behind me is not my real lab, but a photo because that dog isn't moving, which never happens in real life. That dog's name is Grandmother. And he's an author on one of our papers, actually, because he contributed labor to that science, that paper. So um, one of the things that's one of the main teachings that we start with in our lab is the difference between equality and equity. So this is from the film. Oops, which way do I go? Backwards. Things are backwards. So uh, there's this idea that people start from very different social locations. Groups of people start from, from social locations. Indigenous folks very often get the fuzzy end of the lollipop from the settler state. We know that. Um, more likely to be in contaminated areas, more, you know, all this sort of stuff. So equality means you treat them all exactly the same. It's a fairness like math problem. How do we make sure everyone gets the same unit of, of advantage or good or opportunity? But of course, the problem with that is some people start with a lot of opportunity and pe some people don't, and they're always the same sorts of people. So equality doesn't always solve certain problems. Although for the middle guy in this picture, it worked well, but for the folks on the end, not so much. So equity is this idea that tries to address these folks in different social locations. So some, you know, the person on the end gets two boxes, the person who is already above the university fence gets no boxes. Um, and it's much harder to do uh, equity work compared to equality work um, because it's not a math problem. It's dealing with systems and privileges and all sorts of messy stuff and how they intersect. So um, one of the things our lab is most well known for methodologically is our equity and author order approach. Um, which foregrounds all the different labors that go into science that are usually overlooked, like cleaning, like uh, contamination protocols or quality assurance, uh, it's called, which is cleaning, um, organizing people, doing emotional labor, um, doing all the work of making sure partners are always in the loop, making sure our data sovereignty uh, agreements are always in place and the data is always flowing. That stuff almost never gets recognized in scientific papers as labor that contributes to knowledge and we do. Um, and then if there's folks in an author order, so like the order that names are on a paper, um, if there are two people or a group of people that have done sort of similar labor, we would put the folks who are usually left out of science or forced out of science first. So women, indigenous folks, people of color, people with disabilities, junior scholars, uh, elders, those sorts of folks. Um, so that's a, a way to do equality as opposed to, sorry, equity as opposed to equality, which is everyone would get treated the same. Um, like maybe you write down all the labor and give it points and then there's a point system and then the rank emerges or something. So we also do that with um, open source hardware. So open source hardware, the way that we do open source hardware, uh, which means that a lot of the tools we use, uh, we make ourselves and we make them based on the inequity in this province. So there's a few different types of systemic issues in this province. Not a lot of infrastructure, uh, kind of shaky electricity, uh, not a lot of money, um, lots of local knowledge, but not a lot of degrees, uh, and boats are small. 
well, some boats are big, but not a lot of them. Most boats are small. So those sorts of things are what we build our technology for. So I think I have a idea. This is Lady, the low-tech aquatic debris instrument. It's a surface trawl. Uh, basically, you skim the surface of the water, and it, the water goes through that net, and it collects plastics. It's basically like a plankton tow, but it sits on the top of water with those little arms. The Lady um, is, it probably takes $500 to build, and almost all of that is the plankton net, 330 microns. Um, the, the scientific standard for this exact same tool is $3,500, right? And this is $500, mostly net. So if you already have a plankton net, it's like 30 bucks to build out the front of it. And you can build out the front of it with, with hand tools. I mean, if you have something that plugs in and like cuts faster, awesome, but it doesn't need electricity. You can repair it and it's small and light so you can put it off a smaller boat. And someone like me, I can deploy it by myself and I'm five foot two, right? So the manta trawl, I need someone else to help me or I'll get pulled into the water, for instance. And then we also have baby legs. This is baby legs. Baby legs is called baby legs because she's made of baby tights, as you can see. Um, she costs about 20 bucks to make. Uh, baby tights, soda pop bottles, rope, plumber's clamp. That's the list. Um, Baby legs and lady and the manta trawl collect the same type of data. We validate all of them, which is really important because you probably know the efforts that community knowledge needs to have standards to prove that it is somehow equivalent to Western science. And so we do that work um, before we send out these plans. Um, but between baby legs and lady, kind of anyone um, with 20 bucks in their pockets and, so, and a commitment can do the type of science we do. Um, we also, so there's a, there's a trend in plastic pollution science. Look at smaller and smaller and smaller plastics, nanoplastics, that sort of stuff. Super expensive. Our lab looks at some of that stuff, but we always use the cutoff of one millimeter, which is the, the cutoff where you can identify plastics with your eyeballs and a microscope. And, and a cheap microscope, not a scanning electron microscope. Um, and so if any community does work, their work and our work will always be comparable because we always put that sort of equitable science uh, threshold into our studies, for instance. So we build it into our tools, into our studies, uh, our methods. Um, yeah, and we make the case in our papers that that's why we have these sort of size categories. It's for scientific equity. Um, yeah, and so far they've been published. And when we get pushed back, it's usually not that part of the paper. So far, it's usually our statistics. <laughs> so that's good. Well, I really appreciate, um, yeah, I really appreciate that those efforts and um, and those <clears throat> those benchmarks. I can the idea that um, in terms of that the, the equity uh, framework you were describing initially um, that yeah, there's there's people out there who don't have degrees who have questions who have questions that could be answered by research there's communities who have issues um and so having this these tools be available and having your having your research lab model uh the the act of of being available to communities with those questions uh in this way i think is really um yeah it's, it's really inspi inspiring and uh it's powerful work we'll also train anyone who wants to learn so like let's say you you pull a baby legs um, and you get all these tights full of samples. Well, now what do you do with them? You actually, like, you just can't eyeball it because telling the difference between a microplastic and a fish eyeball ends is really, really hard. Um, and you need to be trained on it because a lot of things in the world look like plastics when they're that small. A lot of plastics look like a lot of things in the world, like bug exoskeletons, chunks of bug exoskeletons look just like film plastics. So we'll tr we have both online guides that talk about that, but then we'll also train anyone. As long as we have space, right now we're locked down because of COVID, but um, no one's in the lab. Um, but as long as we have space, um, which we almost always have a little bit of, we'll train anyone who wants um, for free. Well, we'll, uh, we'll start buying plane tickets and sending folks. No. <laughs> yeah, that's not cheap. <laughs> Alaska to Newfoundland Labrador, well, that's not cheap. You could go to Hawaii for a fraction of the price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're so right. Um, I, I remember when, um, when reaching out to you and uh, presenting a, a possible title for this, this conversation and, and writing, em empowering communities with these, you know, anti-colonial scientific methods. And, um, and you wrote back and, and politely, um, you know, compelled me to, to reconsider the, the concept of empowering. And so, as we talk about um, your 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 working with communities, um, 
And uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about that, um, yeah, about that power structure that I was implying with that first draft. Um, yeah, sure. First of all, I'm glad I was polite in my response. That's awesome. Personal growth. That's good. Um, so, I mean, imagine like going to an indigenous community in the north and being like, we're here to give you power. I mean, the response is going to be like, is it? Are you now? Hmm. You a little bit cold? Maybe uh, not really thinking straight because, I mean, we know that's not how power moves. Um, we know that power is systemic. We know it comes from like these these infrastructures and values and norms and legal structures and economic structures and military structures with massive inertia that have lasted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years that we've been fighting for hundreds and hundreds of years with a lot of skill and a lot of numbers and they're not budging all the time or very successfully or at all. And so someone coming in and be like, if I give you here, have a baby legs, now you have power. I mean, that's just cheeky. Right. So, and I think it's important and to have a have a sophisticated and nuanced and appropriate and accountable uh, theory of power or concept of power when you're doing uh, research with indigenous groups um, to make sure you know what what changes do and don't happen. One of the concepts we talk about all the time in the lab is compromise. Right. Um, all the compromises, and not as a bad thing, just as what happens because. There's already, like, I mean, we're an anti-colonial science lab doing Western style science. We've already identified that Western science is super screwed up yeah. and there's, there's not going to be an outside of it. So sometimes when we do things, we produce screwed up things and, and there's no way not to. There's ways to do it better and worse. There's ways not to produce certain parts of it. There's ways to, you know, build out better with better people in better ways. But, but there's no clean slate, right? That's terra nullis. That's the, uh, that's the idea that you can get somewhere and no one's been there before and there's nothing you already have to build in or be accountable to. And that's often what um, empowerment imagines, right? If you just get more tools or just get more money or just teach some skills, um, folks get empowered also, and you didn't use it this way, so kudos, but very often around here it's used to mean inclusion. So we will empower indigenous youth by teaching them to code. Uh, that, uh, that, so, in the lab, we also often critique this concept of inclusion, which I know is often thought of as a good, but including more Indigenous folks into empire, into non-Indigenous ways of being, knowing, and thinking is not actually a win. It's what residential schools were for. And coding is not the same as residential schools at all, but it's still rooted in this idea of good being a certain type of knowledge that comes from the West, you know, Western, you know, Western culture and, and hegemonic, powerful culture, and that we can bring people up by bringing them into, into Western culture. And that's not going to fly, right? So that's where certain, like, uh, inclusion into empire, empowerment, the way it's often used, those are deficit, um, right? So if only we can get more Indigenous folks into universities, right? These sorts of things. Um, those are colonial ideas of good. Mm. Uh, and that is specifically what Clear is trying to deal with. Yeah, yeah the, goods. The, the, we've, the, work that's, um, the work that you do, um, you're the managing editor of uh, Discard Studies. And so in reading, um, yeah, the, reading your article on firstness um, and, uh, and I think it was the, the royal we comes to mind here that um, the, the, the use of the word we can be both inclusive, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's it, on, the, on the surface perhaps appears inclusive, but is in fact divisive. It's, if you're not with us, you're against us. Um, I, I, yeah, I highly recommend audience folks going and, and checking out some of the articles there. It, it writes in depth about some of these, these ideas that we're talking about. Um, just, just to riff on that, one of the one of the things you just referenced is the, the an article called "There's No Such Thing as We," um, where I mean, everyone is everyone. I just did it. Many of you will be familiar uh, with with things like uh, "We are destroying the planet." I mean, again, you go to an Inuit community here, you're destroying the planet. Is it? Are they? No. They are, no, so it's not we, and it's not humanity, because now you just left the Inuit out of humanity. So a lot of, a lot of um, these universalizing we's usually mean a specific set of folks who are in power, who are imagining the entire world to be like them, 
which is the basis of imperialism. Um, so uh, we do a lot of work. Again, if you're going to be humble and accountable, specificity is a necessity for that. And so we are destroying the planet humanity's hope is this we must all come together all of those things uh, aren't specific enough to be properly humble or accountable right so we do a lot of work to be like okay who do we mean by we so sort of like the you know we might all go to ceremony to rematriate guts but there isn't even a lab we right settlers do a different thing than indigenous folks and different like metis inuit and first nations do different things in that ceremony inuit here don't use tobacco I have to grow my own tobacco plants. There's no other way to get in my window. Oh, look at them. They're so small and sad because I live in Newfoundland, Labrador, right? Tobacco doesn't live here, but I, I got to use it because I'm mischief. Um, so I'll do tobacco, but Nina don't do tobacco. That's ridiculous. They do other stuff. So, so that sort of specificity is really important. Um, and, and a lot of these universalizing claims, even again, when they mean good, we must all band together. No, Turo Wampum. We can go in the same direction, but get out of my river. Mm. <laughs> Keep accidentally well-intentioned, screwing it up. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I really appreciate that because um, these these words have power, and th these words are related to ideas that it's it takes a nudge. It's sometimes a pretty hearty push to to, to question those things, and they they feel very ingrained at times. Um, yeah, I remember reading um, your there's a quote, I think, on your website about your, your new book that's coming out, that colonialism at its core is about non-Indigenous access to Indigenous land, knowledge, and life for the goals of the non-Indigenous, including when those goals are benevolent. And the, yeah, these, these ideas and these, these practices that it may feel like it's, uh, it's something that's being done for the greater good, but it's, yeah, often the greater good of the we or the greater good of, yeah, the perceived uh, <laughs> the group of, that, as you say, is probably the ones in power. Um, congratulations, by the way, about that upcoming book, Pollution is Colonialism. Um, Thank would you, you. Yeah, would you care to say a few words about, about it and to the audience? Sure. Uh, I wrote it like three years ago at this point, so it takes a long time for the book to pop out onto paper. Um, uh, I think it's a cool book. I'm almost biased. Um, it it talks about sort of this 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 idea that even well-intentioned pollution activism in science is almost always, when it comes out of the Western view, um, colonial by accident, right? So threshold models of pollution, which lets you pollute up to a certain amount, uses indigenous land as a sink, um, disposability of plastics, which means like you make you industry makes plastics. And it depends on indigenous land to like store it for time for eternity because of that's how disposables works. So it starts by talking about different models of pollution and pollution activism and pollution science and their relationships to colonialism. So environmental mainstream environmental relationships to colonialism. Then it talks about examples of scientists and activists who aren't doing that, even though they aren't indigenous. Right, so you don't have to be indigenous for anti-indigenous technologies to cause harm, or for colonial technologies and techniques to cause harm. So it, it you know, exa it looks at actually some of the science around endocrine disruption, and people like Patricia Hunt, who maybe you folks are familiar with because of her work on endocrine disruptors and BPA in particular, who was like, you know what, screw the threshold, screw it, like not using thresholds as allowable limits of pollution is anti-colonial science, right, in a in a way. And then we end by talking, I end by talking about the lab. Um, and some of the things we've been talking about um, more explicitly. So basically, it's this idea that research is uh, methods are always always have land relations, and you can choose those land relations. You don't have to default to the ones that have been served to you, and it gives you some tools to try and interrogate the land relations of things you think might just be objective or neutral or statistical or something like that. Um, and actually, there's a there's a comment I see in the Q and A. Um, about the term empowerment and uh, its misuse or its imperial use in Suriname in, in South America, um, where Indigenous folks are socioeconomically classed as poor, right? When, of course, we are rich with knowledge and relations and all these sorts of stuff. And there's this awesome book um, that I use to think about this with called Indigenous Statistics by uh, Maggie Walter and Chris Anderson, where they say, okay, 
almost all like census and other big data statistics about indigenous folks are based on deficits. So by census measures, indigenous people have less education, less money, uh, less jobs, less life expectancy, let whatever. And, and it can only measure deficit because it cannot measure the richness of our relations, the richness of our language, the richness of our practices, the rich, you know, all of this sort of stuff. And so they, so their sort of thesis or argument in the book is how do you do good work with bad statistics that got it wrong from the start, but they're your numbers and you want to do good anti-colonial and indigenous statistics what do you do in that compromise space? And that spirit is very much what we try and do in the lab. Um, yeah, try and try and wend our way through highly compromised spaces uh, in Western science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's much appreciated that you do that. Um, yeah, the, so talking about these sort of fraught ideas, you know, empowerment, um, or yeah, the, I'm curious if you could say a few words about yeah alternative forms of engagement um, and you know collaboration or. Uh, so in the lab book, in the new version of the lab book, which I don't think you've seen, there's a there's a section called words we do and do not use to as again as an orienting technology, and one of the words we don't use is community engagement or outreach. Okay. <laughs> uh, and there's a story in the lab book about uh, when I was a kid. Um, I remember we were at our house and this, this woman drove up in this big car and she got out and she gave us a turkey. The strange lady drove out and gave us a turkey. And we lived in the bush, right? The deep bush when I was a kid. And she laughed, we were all very polite. And she laughed and I asked my mom, why did the lady give us a turkey? And my mom laughed and said, it's because she thinks we're poor. It was Thanksgiving. It was a food basket from one of the churches. Um, and that's how I learned we were poor. Right? I was, I don't know, 12 or something like that. And I... I thought that was pretty funny because our house fit all the people in it, which did not always happen in the, in the white community, as far as I could tell. So I, anyway, so that was outreach. And that is always my example of outreach, outreach that told me I was poor when as far as, you know, so um, outreach is also creepy. Just think about it. You're sitting there minding your own business. And then this hand comes along. Oh, Zoom is perfect for this because it dissolves my hand halfway through. And it's, and now you're you're like what? I don't know what. Out, getting outreached is is creepy and not fun, and usually assumes deficit, right? Um, community should know what we know here in the academy or in the research center. And if they only knew, they would behave differently, and they will be interested in our research questions. Why on earth? Why on earth would they be interested in your research questions? Um, An engagement. It can mean everything from, sh so this happened, showing up in an Inuit community as researchers uh, at a community gathering and holding everyone hostage during your horrible PowerPoint um, presentation and not realizing that it was a funeral, which has happened, um, and calling that a win because you just did community engagement all the way to like full partnership. And engagement can mean any of that. And so again, you cannot be properly humble and accountable without specificity. So we don't use outreach because it's creepy and engagement because what the hell does that mean? But we do things like articulate the types of partnership we have. So some of the partnerships that I have, I work, I'm basically the technician or data grunt, the lab grunt for indigenous nations and communities who are like, we're sending you samples please process them and give us back the data. I don't know what their research questions are. I don't know what they're doing. I don't, and it's none of my business or insofar that I need to process the samples. But other than that, it's not my business. And I don't use the data because it's not mine. Mm -hmm. And then there's stuff where um, I have an Inuit research partner, Liz Puji with, with uh, Nunat Siavut, and we do everything together. Um, she's the land expert. I'm the lab expert. Um, we, we figure out everything together. We analyze the results together. Um, the data is ours together, the presentations, there's always two of us. Um, yeah, so there's, whole, there's a whole range. So specificity is really important to, the, to those models, I think. Um, and the flashy, and yes, sometimes you gotta like play the grant game and you say all sorts of stuff and use the language and that's what I mean by compromise. And that is fine. Sometimes you gotta grift, that is legit. You gotta hustle. We, <laughs> I mean, that is a skill set you gotta have. Um, but you also have to keep your ethics straight. Yeah. Uh, and that requires specificity.
that makes sense. Yeah, I was wondering about the funding opportunities because uh, yeah, in that world, in the academic Western world, yeah, funders want to hear about your your outcomes that you're going to create. And so it seems so much that uh, the values and the protocols are the priority here um, that the outcomes, are, <laughs> anyway, I'm not sure if a funder would necessarily immediately appreciate that, but it sounds like you've, you've struck a good balance. Yeah. I see a few more questions. There's a, there's a, yeah, just just to I'll let up in that, and, and there's something in the chat about it too, and then I'll get to the, to Eric's question um, that I see in the chat. So there's this concept called strategic essentialism. This lady named Spivak um, termed it, and Indigenous folks use this all the time in land claims and other sort of stuff. Where sometimes you just like giddy up on the stereotype because it'll get you what you need. So like, yes, I'm a weak woman. Please make me a smaller trawl. Okay, cool. Now I have a smaller trawl and I can do all this stuff with it that has nothing to do with being a weaker woman, right? Fine, cool. But I put that, you know, that was my whatever, right? Or like Indigenous people cannot possibly survive without this land. Okay, we're really resilient. We can survive without this land fundamentally differently, but give us our land claim. Thank you very much, right? So, so you've got to do that in grants. You've got to do that. I mean, when the game is rigged, strategic essentialism is a really important hustle, I think. Um, so there's a question about expertise and interpreting data. So it is true that if you would like to do a statistical analysis of something, you need to know a little bit about statistics. Um, so, so first of all, just to back up, there's many forms of expertise. Liz, my research partner, does not know how to do stats. She doesn't really write or read. She chooses not to because it's a pain in the butt. She knows everything about land relations and what's going on with Arctic char and where they are and what they like and when and how many we can sample that so it won't impact the, you know, the population, all this sort of stuff, a lot of which are Western scientific concepts. She's a master of observation. Um, she's an expert. If I go into the ice there, I will be dead in 10 minutes without Liz. That's expertise. If Liz comes into my lab, she's like, what does this do? And she pokes a thing and breaks a million dollar piece of equipment just like I would die on the ice. So there's, so we each do a role and that's part of why we collaborate because we have different forms of expertise and when they come together, we each see new things in our own areas. Um, but there's also something called participatory statistics that I've started doing. So Liz is an expert, for instance, in her community. And if I do some statistics on our data and say, hey Liz, according to this, uh, there's no difference between between when Arctic char eat plastics in the summer versus when you ice fish them and they're in fresh water. There's no difference statistically. She would say, bullshit. That is a form of statistical validation. It's called the bullshit test. I would say, oh, why do you think that's bullshit? She would say, because we catch so many fewer fish in the winter and they're feeding lower down, that's where the plastics are. And I say, oh, let me check that, like, let me correct for the population size or let me, let me sort that according to where in the water column we're getting them from. Oh, you're right. There is a statistic difference now. Okay, right. So, so there's so. Just because you don't need this, know the super technical stuff, doesn't mean you can't interpret the data. But the work has to be done so that the data makes sense in the world. And if your research partner can't do that, then they're not very good at translation work, which is part of I think our jobs. Um, so, yeah. So this is uh, participatory statistics is something we're doing with one of our new projects. Um, which uh, is on food sovereignty and security, where we're looking at food prices. Um, and people know, right? So if I statistically say that food prices in the city are the same as in the North, people say bullshit. And then, I'll, and then they'll tell me how to nuance my data. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. I see there's one little follow-up question from Eric there uh, about can picking people's brains be intrusive? Of course. Get your fingers out of my brain. Um, so uh, actually a lot of black scholars talk about this too when it comes to racism. Can I pick your brain about racism? <laughs> Can I pick your brain about, you know, so um, putting picks in my brain does not sound like a good time. So is there a, re a reciprocal version of that? Mm -hmm. um, there's also very often, almost always I'd say when people hit my inbox uh, or my Twitter and ask to pick my brain, they are almost always able to Google that shit themselves. Um, almost always I'm doing teaching that I'm not getting paid for. And yes, it is my responsibility to be generous. And my elders are very clear about that. But I can't be so generous that I enter a sacrifice economy where I can never do higher level work with the stuff that's already in my brain. Um, so there is a lot of ethics 
involved in that kind of request. There's a accountability um, that has to be part of those requests. I'm not saying don't do them, but I'm saying be aware. Um, be aware that those things exist uh, and, and make sure you maneuver them in a good way. Um, yeah, for my honest answers, I'm trying to swear less, so apologies on some of the swearing. Um, I know it's turn off for some folks and a turn on for others. Um, yeah, this can be, so Liz too, like <laughs> Liz, will, Liz will sometimes, especially when we're at conferences where there are a lot of non-Indigenous folks and they're like, oh, local knowledge, what do, how do we approach it? And Liz was like, ask me. And I'm like, don't ask me. I find it annoying. But Liz doesn't find it annoying, right? So, so there are folks, you know, um, but also like my job is to answer those questions all the time and I usually get paid for it and Liz doesn't. So there's, you know, there's no perfect answer because there's always specificity of relations. Yeah. Yeah. Be it the, yeah, the, the uniqueness of an individual or the f uniqueness of working in Newfoundland Labrador, uh, the uniqueness, yeah. Of yeah. existing power and privileges and context, all those things. And that's why it's important to like, that's why when we say like relations are at the core of everything, that's really what we mean. Like that's how you get to know what those, those things are. Um, it's putting in the time for relations, relation work. I like the comment from Eric. Sometimes understanding can't be Googled. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But at the same time, th this conversation I'm putting online, I write publicly constantly because the questions I get asked over and over again, I put them online. When people say, what is colonial science? I'm like, I have that online, right? So there's also some of us who do put this work so that you can Google it so that we can skip the 101 um, and people can do some homework. Um, before they come for our brains. Yeah. And that can get cited, which helps with our careers in a way that like picking my brain doesn't help my career, for instance, or contribute to it, I should say. Yeah. Something that struck me, um, well, I should say that, yeah, questions, questions are totally welcome at this stage. You know, they've been welcome throughout, but yeah, please do chime in folks um, as we near the top of the hour. But uh, yeah, one, one other thing that I did want to bring up is when, Consider when reaching out to you as a as a guest for um, for Che here. I was initially thought, oh, I was really excited to talk about marine microplastics and the and the research and the the impacts on the human food system and. You can Google that. I know exactly That's that. You can Google. I know, and I so I realized as I read, I continue to read that that the that the impactful scientific work of Clear uh, and your lab. That, that 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 focus is uh, is paired with this focus on making social change and and modeling these anti-colonial and feminist and indigenous methods and um, it was uh, that that really struck me as 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 unique and so I'm I'm both curious how you balance if if this if it's challenging at all to balance those two focuses or if there's other organizations out there who are also modeling this in ways that we could turn our attention to and Google and learn from. Um, yeah, so the way I do it is by having two simultaneous careers and I don't have like very many friends and I don't sleep very much, which isn't the best model in the world. Um, I mean, I have good friends, there's not that many. Um, and some of them are dogs. Uh, so there are other labs that are doing this. There's actually a list on our on our website uh, because we get this question asked a lot. Some of them are indigenous labs, uh, including actually a couple in Alaska whose names I don't have off the top of my head, but they're online on our website. Um, there's also like anti-colonial labs in the social sciences. Um, like Dark Laboratory, it's called, which is an alliance between uh, Black and Indigenous folks at Cornell. Um, or there's the TRU, the Techno Science Research Unit in Toronto, which is an Indigenous-led, Métis-led um, social science, chemical science and technology studies. I mean, I don't think they have a discipline uh, dealing with stuff in Chemical Valley Lab um, that also has a lab book like ours that also does value-based stuff like ours. Um, there's a feminist endocrinology lab that is that you, so they don't do anti-colonial work. They do feminist work and equity work very explicitly. Um, the Vansari lab um, in Ontario um, that you know does parallel types of work. So you know we're we're not terribly unique. And honestly, like I try and model myself off of Rick Chavoya, my my elder mentor and godfather, because he does this in his kitchen in his living room, and I just try and do it in the lab. And he's better at it than I am in his living room than I am in the lab. So. Yeah, not so unique. <laughs>
we've we've been broadly talking about about equity in science and you know uh, representation attribution authorship um and uh some of these values and guiding principles of the research methods i'm i'm curious if you could speak to how this becomes an issue of health equity um as well for uh, for yourself and other communities in newfoundland you mean like how the plastic issue is also a, a wellness issue? Yeah. Or you mean, yeah? Yeah, and, and access um, to research is also a wellness issue. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, some of the best researchers that I know are on the ice, right? They're, right. Um, and just getting credit for it um, is a different issue. Um, so, I really admire someone like Liz Hoover's work on, on the, the wellness and contaminants area. So, one of the best sort of stories or examples that she has is, again, in, in a chemical chemical alley, um, where she says when there are fish advisories, um, then people don't fish. Makes sense. Uh, but if they don't fish, then uh, youth and elders aren't hanging out together, and they're not teaching them how to tie knots, and they don't learn the word for the knot in the Indigenous language, and they're not building those relations, and they're, right, and so not eating fish actually has huge cultural ramifications that have nothing to do with nutrition or, like, the cultural salience of fishing in the way it's often meant, which is, like, the place of fish in cosmology or something, uh, which, in, which in Métis culture is, is very real, right, trout, they get shit done, right, in our cosmologies, um, so, uh, so that's part of wellness, right, um, and fish advisories therefore become part of like cultural genocide traditions and I don't cultural genocide is still genocide right it's just a specific avenue for that um so yeah those things are all very tied together or climate change and then you can't get out onto the land even if you don't catch anything um that time that that's still it's important to get out into the land and not catch anything sometimes right so th so these things are always always bundled together and that's part of humility right mm -hmm. so trying to when we we didn't realize for a while that we were doing food sovereignty work um, until people said, you're doing our food sovereignty work. Thank you. And we said, oh, yes, yes, we are. Here we go. Um, because we, we, you know, work with people's freezers. We work with um, people fishing, right? That sort of stuff. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, that's fabulous. Um, and I was just turning to the, yeah, the, see some more questions coming in. Um, there's one here uh, from an anonymous uh, listener saying, going back to the point of, um, of humility and accountability without specificity, they're wondering what are examples of asking, um, demanding for accountability from Western thought teams who use these buzzwords. Um, they suggest, you know, high poverty schools, marginalized, etc., for policy gains to receive funding to perpetuate colonial science education. Yeah, especially when you're the only and the lonely, right, which is also part of the call. You're the only. Uh, Black, Indigenous, or person of color, you're the only woman, you're the only one who does community work, you're the only social scientist, you're the only, um, those things are deeply alienating and they can't be not highly alienating because of that exact setup if you're the only and the lonely, um, which is by the way, Eve Tuck's term, not mine, if you liked it. Um, so um, that comes back into compromise, right? You're in these, and sometimes the compromise is worth it and sometimes it's not. And figuring that out is really important. So at this stage of my career, I refuse to be the only and the lonely. Um, I have, however, uh, I'm starting on something called like anti-colonial budgeting. So there was this huge uh, funding call in Atlantic Canada doing this huge European style, like 23 principal investigators, each with their own teams for these giant sacks of money. But one of the caveats was there must be indigenous engagement super vague and so I so I ran around with a big sign on my face saying I will be your pet Indian if you give me 350k a year and don't talk to me right don't ask for my data don't ask me to come to meetings I'll give you your annual reports whatever but don't touch me or outreach me or anything else this is how much I cost and uh and there was a team that was a pretty strong team except they didn't have any indigenous engagement and so they bought me and I named my price 350k a year for three years. And I am basically just handing that money off to indigenous uh, water protector, um, watershed protector uh, groups. I don't even know what they do with the money. And it doesn't matter because no one's going to get the data or right. So um, I was very willing to make that compromise. There are other compromises. If the compromise keeps me up at night and gives me insomnia, then I won't do it. Right? If it doesn't give me insomnia, that's all right, because my body and the spirits are pretty smart, 
via insomnia of telling me where those boundaries are. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps. It does indeed suck. And if people do not understand the language of accountability or the practices of accountability, they will be unable to be accountable. And if I notice that, I refuse to work with folks um, if you have the privilege of not working with folks. Oh my God, there's so many little thingies and the little pop-ups now. <laughs> Feel free to, to, if you want to, to take them, uh, Dr. Lieber, on and choose them too. Uh, sure, there's one, there's one that's asking for a little bit more on the research questions planning grants. Um, so I am a very skilled grant writer. Um, and that is because I'm very good at telling charismatic stories that I'm pretty sure the listeners, white grantors, whatever, want to hear. Um, I'm very willing to use strategic essentialism. The Inuit and climate change, what is happening? Ways of life are being threatened. All of those things are true, but then the money all goes to fishers. That's fine, right? Um, so, so I understand a huge part of my job to be grifting to be passing, especially as a white Métis, to be passing, to be circulating, to sound like the people like me to sound, uh, all the while doing a hustle to hand off money to land. Um, and I'm very good at that. Um, things like putting diagrams in my grants that show relationality and really see them to nail it down into a definition for folks. People really like that. I'll do all that for them. Um, yeah, also in terms of research question plans, et cetera, those always, at this point, those always come from communities for me. So I work, I've been working on community research questions forever. My job is to translate it into charisma. Um, and that's what I do. I, I did, and it's not like I just happen to be good at it. I trained first with a Christian orator in New York City who is a street preacher who is very good at getting people's attention in a short period of time. And I on purpose trained with him on the street for my scientific and research career because he was so good at getting people to stop and listen and think on their way over and I was like mm, I need my grants to do that and then also training or sitting with um, elder master elder master storytellers who take forever to tell a story but also change your lives right so those are skills I developed um, charismatic storytelling and grants um, I don't know if that helps but um, it's part of a technique I think of doing anti-colonial science uh, and it is an indigenous methodology, I would say, storytelling um, for change and for world building. Is there uh, is there one more one more question we'd like to to get to here before the end of the hour? Sure. Um, there's a question about addressing local pollution problems that stem from local behaviors, sometimes indigenous, sometimes not. So I've actually written a public blog post called uh, pollution or no, waste is infrastructure, not behavior. Um, so one of the main sources of plastic pollution in this province on this side, this lower part of the province is cigarette butts. 88% of terrestrial litter is cigarette butts and 25% of shoreline litter is cigarette butts. <laughs> the health movement never happened here the way it happened in the rest of the country. Um, that looks a lot like behavior. And that is the action of people tossing their butts. There is also zero places to put your butts. There is also zero campaigns for people to not smoke. There's also almost no uh, help for people to not smoke. There's also nothing to help people reclaim those butts to re-roll their own or place to put those. There's no infrastructure. And without infrastructure, people cannot change the behavior. What's assured me of this or what set me on this path where I believe this very strongly is I did a study when I was a graduate student about bottled water at New York University, which is one of the major drivers of bottled water sales in New York City because NYU is so big. Mm -hmm. And I was all prepared to do behavior change. But then I thought, but I don't know why people drink bottled water because I don't do it because I think it's stupid. So I then learned that it is not in fact stupid. I looked at, there was this case where there was a broken water fountain or there was a water fountain and there was a, a soda machine uh, machine in the same place. And as luck would have it, sometimes the, the vending machine was broken and sometimes the fountain wouldn't work. And there was also a bathroom where you could fill up your water bottle. And almost everyone would use what worked and what was there. And only a fraction, 2% of people would always fill up their water bottle and 2% of people would always wait for bottled water and everyone else did what was there and worked. And so that is why I believe a lot more in infrastructure. That's also where power comes from. 
I do not have a choice in this teeny tiny northern place not to buy plastic packaging. That is not a choice that exists. When land gets, when Inuit populations get settled, they no longer really have the choice to do full sustenance hunting and fishing, right? They have to buy pack, pack, pa plastic packaging. That's not exactly behavior, although they are behaving. So that's the framework. I always look to infrastructure and I always look upstream because that's how power works. That's why you can't empower people. I am sad to say that we've reached the, the top of the hour. Um, these are, uh, I've, I've certainly learned a lot. <laughs> and um, so I wanna thank you, Dr. Liberon and, uh, and the participants as well who joined us today and their questions. I'll be sending out an email within the next day or two with a link to the recording of this conversation um, that we can share and um, a, a list of additional related resources, um, things that I should Google, uh, and <laughs> as well as some of the articles that were referenced um, over the last hour. So also all of this is in my new book, like everything I know is in that book. And it's just as cheeky and sweary. So if you like that style, if you like the candor, book is for you. Remind us when, so when does it come out? Uh, April 31st. Great. So it's, yeah, it's just around the corner. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll put a link in of that for that as well. Uh, the, the, next, the next conversation we'll be having will be at the end of March on the 31st, when we'll be talking with two researchers from the Endocrine Society um, that co-authored that report I mentioned with IPEN, the International Pollutants Elimination Network, um, uh, the plastics, EDCs, and our health. And that'll be at the same, the same time um, if you can chip in and donate to support these monthly CHE calls, that's always appreciated. Um, you can give at our website, akaction.org. And I'm happy to answer any additional questions, um, point you in the right direction the best that I can. Um, so don't hesitate to contact us here in Alaska at 907-222-7714. Um, yeah, and thanks uh, again so much, Dr. Lieberon, for your time um, and for your insight on these issues. And I'm wishing you and, and everyone else a wonderful rest of your day.